Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony, and welcome to lesson number 11 of our series, The Better Covenant. I tell you, I just love this series. I love teaching on it because this has really opened up a large part of my understanding to the whole Word of God, and particularly the New Covenant, the New Testament, where you and I live today. Now, we've already established the fact in previous lessons, just generally briefly, that this New Covenant is the Now Covenant for all of us as believers in Christ. And it is a better covenant established on better promises. And as we found out in the last lesson, it brings in a better hope, a better, more confident expectation of God's goodness manifesting in our life. Now, we left off to some degree, I think yesterday, in John's Gospel chapter 1. So let's go over to the Gospel of John chapter 1 again today and just kind of pick up where we left off in the last lesson and if you missed the last lesson again you need to go back and listen to the previous ones because we're just kind of picking up where we where we left off in the previous lesson and laying another uh, layer of foundation on that one and uh, that's kind of the way it's going to go we don't have a whole lot of time to review here uh, other than hit just some highlights here and there but gospel of john chapter 1 verse number 14 and then down to 16 in just a second. But verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. Now again, that's talking about the pre-existent identity of Jesus Christ being the Son of the living God and the agent of creation. It says, And the Word became flesh. That's, what he, that's when He became, He identified with us by becoming flesh and blood. We all celebrate His birth every year at Christmas, and we should. Uh, but notice He says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now notice that Jesus, the person of Jesus, and His identity as the only begotten of the Father carried a weight of glory attached to it. And they saw that. They saw a revelation of that. But then notice that it was also full of grace and truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. We carry that thought on down to verse number 16, and it says, and of his fullness. Now again, what is he full of? He's full of grace and truth. And it says, and of his fullness we have all received. I love that right there. That, that God's not picking and choosing. The grace of God has appeared to all men, the Bible says. Now, not all men have received it. We certainly do not believe that in what we call universalism, where you know everybody's just going to get saved regardless of whether they accept or reject Jesus. Absolutely not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one is going to come to the Father except through Him. There's not many ways to God. There's not many ways of salvation. There's only one, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, I do not apologize for that. I don't care how unpopular that might be to some people. Jesus is the only way. He is it. But notice, we don't need another way. We need to accept Jesus for who He is, and we can receive, all of us, all of us can receive that fullness that's in him of grace and truth. In other words, if I take you know the fullness of grace and truth in my life, if I receive that from Jesus, it's not going to knock somebody else out. It's not going to make it less for somebody else. There's enough grace for all of us to go around if we will receive it by faith. And of course, faith is a, and we're going to look at the the aspect of faith toward the end of this series, but. Faith just responds to what God has already done and given us through grace in Christ. Faith has to respond to something. It's a responder, not a, an initiator, so to speak. And what is it responding to? This fullness of grace and truth that God is pouring out through the gift of His Son to all of us. But then it says, and grace for grace. Now, I mentioned the Amplified and other translations, how it brings the, the Greek wording out a little bit better. So I'm going to read the last part of that particular verse right there in the Amplified. It says, One grace after another, and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. 
So in other words, there's not a there's not an insufficiency in the grace of God like there is in our works. There's insufficiency and inadequacy, weakness in us. That's why the old covenant law of Moses did not work. But that's what makes this new covenant of grace in Christ far better. And this is what makes it work is because what God is pouring out to us and giving to us in Jesus is an endless supply of grace, grace upon grace. And it says spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing and even favor upon favor. That's what grace is, it's unmerited favor. And gift heat upon gift. See, this tells us how valuable and worthy the sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of the living God is. This tells us exactly how much worth he is. That's why the old covenant sacrifices of animals didn't work because they were inferior in worth and value. But Jesus is far superior and therefore brings an abundant, unlimited, overflowing supply of grace that will meet every need of man that he will ever have. Where the old covenant was demanding out of us, this new covenant of grace in Christ supplies to us. Where the old covenant demanded righteousness and we failed, the new covenant supplies righteousness and then we receive it and walk in it and live in it by faith. Now, I just mentioned something right there that people are going, hmm, unlimited grace. See, because we're still thinking many times about God's love for us and God's grace in terms of man. There, and we're, we're trying to filter that through humanity, but God is not a man. And what he gives and how he loves is unconditional. It's not conditional. How he bestows grace is not in limited rations but in unlimited, abundant, overflowing proportions. Now, I will back that up. Let's go over to Ephesians, Ephesians, the second chapter. And if you've been with us in, in any of these series, some of this is familiar to, territory to all of us, and particularly in Ephesians, because Ephesians is all about New Covenant realities, and New Covenant realities is all about the grace that God's pouring out of uh, on us wave after wave after wave, endless waves coming in to uh, the shores of our life through the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, let's look in Ephesians 2, verse 5, on down. It says, even when we were dead, that's the way we were, dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So he's emphasizing that it's by grace we have been saved. Notice, we didn't, we didn't become alive, we didn't make ourselves alive, we didn't earn this, we didn't achieve this. This is all by the grace of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Now verse six says, and, there's a conjunction there, so that's, there's more to this. He says, and raised us up together. So in other words, verse five, he made us alive together with Christ. And then verse six, he raised us up together and there's another one made us sit together in the heavenly places in christ jesus now the amplified brings this out at verse number six it says and he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere notice we have the same heavenly seat at the right hand of god that jesus himself does now how in the world could we ever accept such a a reality, a fact of our redemption is that. Well, if you are looking at this whole scenario from an old covenant point of view, which is man to God, you will never get there. It will never work out. But if you turn around and begin to reason according to the new covenant of grace, which means God to man, then you see that it's through the grace of God toward man in Christ that he raised us up he seated us in heavenly places in the same heavenly seat as Jesus himself. Now listen, that's not taken away from Jesus because he, he was, is, and always will be the son of the living God. Now thank God that we were through the grace of God, and again, we're gonna look at this later on, we were included in sonship. We were born of the Father. We have that same Father, spiritual Father, as Jesus himself does. But that, none of this is achieved. 
None of it's earned. But if again, if you're reasoning according to the old covenant law of Moses, it's all about the works of man. It's all from man to God. But it reverses that whole thing, and rightfully and thankfully so, in the new covenant, it's all a finished work of God to man through the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where the abundance of grace comes in. Now we'll continue with the Amplified at verse number 7 and read it this way. because this, this is real close. This is a pretty good translation of the original Greek. If, if you just look at just concordances and all that, you'll see it. But verse number 7, he says, He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable. I want you to see the, the, the words he's using to describe this here. The immeasurable limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Now notice right there the kind of words he uses to describe this grace that's being brought in through Jesus and pouring out on us. Notice, immeasurable. You can't measure it. It's too, it's too great, too big, too vast, to measure it. Then it says limitless. That's where I get unlimited from. Limitless would mean unlimited. Then it says surpassing. In other words, no matter what situation you find yourself in, there's a or a need that you have, there's a sur surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Now notice God has always always been kind and good goodness in his heart. He's always been gracious. He's always loved us. But because of sin and the fall of man, it created some legal ramifications that he himself had to deal with. That separated us away from God. God could not do legally for us what he wanted to do, what was in his heart all before the foundation of the world when he created man because of those legal situations that sin and the fall of man uh, you know, from the first Adam all the way up, had created. And so therefore, that's why Jesus had to come. You know, God didn't just get born again, all of a sudden have a change of heart and mind toward man and said, I love you all of a sudden. No, he always loved us the same. Always had kindness and goodness and graciousness in his heart. But he had, he had to deal legally because he is the righteous judge. He is justice. He had to deal with the sin issue. And through Jesus... We see grace and truth met together. We see grace and truth put together in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, where God could meet the legal uh, uh, demands of justice, satisfy the claims of justice because of sin and the fall of man uh, uh, that was against all of us, that con condemning sentence that was hanging over all of our heads he dealt with that in truth without compromising his justice and showing us extended, unlimited, uh, immeasurable, surpassing grace uh, in, in the process. I tell you, only God could do that. He is this so he is so smart. He just outsmarts the devil, all the adversaries, because I'm telling you, Satan underestimated the love and the grace of God. He completely underestimated that. And that was his downfall right there. And there's more to that. But notice in verse 8, I'll shift back over to the New King James. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Notice, it's all the gift of God. It's all by grace that we're saved through faith. In other words, faith is a response to that grace. It does not come from ourself. It is not of ourself. It is of God. It comes from God to man through Jesus. And then in verse 9 it says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And again, that's really making a distinguishing mark between the old covenant law of Moses, which is all based on works and performance, and this new covenant in Christ, which is all based on grace and truth and the finished work of Jesus. Now, with that in mind, let's go look over to Romans chapter 5. And again, if you've been with us any length of time in, these, uh, in any of my teachings, any previous series, 
then we've we've spent some time in the book of Romans chapter 5 because if it's all based on grace we need to have an understanding a proper Bible understanding of grace not some of the stuff that may be perpetuated out there it's got in one side of the ditch or another but let's find out from the Bible how it interprets the word grace and we're gonna see really what it is and what it includes we we're always seeing that right now but here in Romans chapter 5 and I'm gonna read just verse 15 and just for I use a go to the Amplified that is a great translation of verse 15 it brings out so much of the meaning to help us understand it but I don't, I'm gonna look at this one in the Passion translation today okay so the Passion translation of Romans 515 says now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience now here he's going all the way back to the first Adam and comparing the first Adam with the last Adam the Bible calls Jesus he's the last Adam, not the second he's the last in other words there's a first and a last that's it the last one replaced the first thank God so it says now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression what he did as bad as it was that's what sent Jesus to the cross that's what opened up and gave hell entrance into this earth to create all kinds of opposition and oppression of mankind throughout the years so we're not belittling man Adam's transgression but in comparison between Adam's transgression there is no comparison it says between what Adam did and the gracious gift that we are experiencing here in this new covenant he says for the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime I love that the magnitude of the gift because he's so valuable because Jesus is such a valuable gift and sacrifice the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime in other words he's Jesus is an overpayment that's what he's saying yeah God knew exactly what it would what it would take to pay for man's transgression to the very last cent the very last bit of it in other words fill the cup to the brim and don't overflow it all right that's it but you know what because of God's overflowing love and grace to us and because he wanted to demonstrate that to all of us through Jesus in this new covenant he just took it and met, gave Jesus and then overflowed the cup and made Jesus an overpayment for our sin why is that because God doesn't want there to be any doubt in your mind at all any question any doubt in your mind need to be settled once and once for all that the price for your salvation forgiveness of sin and the elimination of condemnation in your life has been met once and once for all through Jesus not by you and Jesus but by Jesus alone and it goes on to say it's true that many died because of one man's transgression but how much greater will God's grace Notice, many died through one man's transgression, and that happened. A lot of people have suffered because of that. It says, but how much greater, I love that, how much greater in comparison will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow? That's what I was just talking about, what we were describing. His gracious gift of acceptance overflowed to many because of one man, Jesus, the Messiah, did for us what God did through his son Jesus in his death burial resurrection his finished work of the cross is far 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 greater far greater far greater I mean infinitely far greater than what Satan was able to pull off through sin in the first Adam yes sin was bad that's what again sent Jesus to the cross the cross the horrors of the cross but on the same the same regard when you're comparing these two they become incomparable in fact the Amplified brings that out it becomes disproportional and incomparable when you start comparing the first Adam last Adam Jesus first Adam sin and then the grace of God through the finished work of Jesus those become an incomparable disproportional comparison in other words you can't they're not even in the same league so to speak now he goes on to say down in verse number 20 he says moreover and he, he says some things we'll get back to those later on he says moreover the law entered 
that the offense might, might abound. But where sin abounded, grace has abounded much more. Now I'll go back to the Passion Translation of verse 20. Just to get another translation so we'll help us understand this. Verse 20, it says, So then the law was introduced into God's plan to bring the reality of human sinfulness out of hiding. That's what it was for. That to expose man's inability and inadequacy to save himself and to expose the sin nature and the sin condition in all of us. And it says, And yet, wherever sin increased, there was more than enough of God's grace to triumph all the more. I love that right there. I also love the Amplified of this. We're going to read this. we got to get this. This is, if the, if the New Covenant is better, we need to understand why it's better. It's because of this right here, okay? Finished work of Jesus. All right, so verse 20 in the Amplified, it says, But then law came in only to expand and increase the trespass, making it more apparent and exciting opposition. In other words, you know, just it just, it just magnified sin. It didn't, you know, the law did not create a an avenue for man to overcome sin. It actually made it worse. And he goes on to that in Romans and talks about why that's the case. But then it goes on to say here, but where sin increased and abounded. Notice, sin increased and abounded. <laughs> it says law, God's unmet, or, or grace, grace, I'm not saying a lot, grace, <laughs> God's unmerited favor has surpassed it and increased the more and has super abounded. Again, there's that overflow that we were talking about. See, what God gave in Christ and what Jesus brought to us in his finished work and his sacrifice brought an unlimited, immeasurable grace to us that just overwhelms and overflows sin and all attached to sin and the fall of man. See, this is the kind of relationship we have with God now. This is what we have under the new covenant they did not have under the old. This is why we should have a far better life because this is a better covenant, better grace, better in everything than what they had. So why go back to the old when we have the new sitting here in front of us that we're living in? All right, with that in mind, let's look, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to have time to get through all of this in this lesson, so we're going to have to kind of, you know, get through some of it, introduce it, and then pick it up in the next lesson. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and again, this is a big comparison between the old covenant law of Moses and the new covenant we have in Christ, the reality that we have in Christ Jesus. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, and it says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Notice, we have such trust through Christ towards God. Verse 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, for but our sufficiency is from God. I want you to see that right there. I'll read that one more time. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. See, that's what the old covenant law of Moses exposed was the insufficiency that we had of ourselves. So it says, not that we should be not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. In other words, salvation, righteousness, nothing comes from us, from self from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Our sufficiency is from God. Where, where, the, where we lacked, where, the, where we were exposed and proven to be insufficient and inadequate, God proved that His sufficiency was more than enough for us, that it was more than enough through Christ. That's why we have such trust through Christ toward God because our sufficiency is from God. That's why it's dangerous to put any trust in ourselves. But if we're putting our trust in us, if, in other words, we're looking to ourselves 
and we're trying to produce something of ourselves, then I tell you, all we're going to do is end up in a road, of, a dead end road of frustration because we're going to do nothing but prove that we are insufficient in and of ourselves. But when we shift that focus and that trust toward Christ and toward Christ, uh, toward God, where all sufficiency comes from, then that becomes more than enough to answer any need and eliminate all problems and needs in our life, insufficiencies in our life. Now look at verse number six. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. There it is. He made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Notice, our sufficiency is from God. He made us sufficient as ministers of the, or distribution centers, I like to say, of the new covenant. Not of the letter, that's old covenant, but of the spirit, new covenant. For the letter kills, old covenant, but the spirit gives life, new covenant. Verse 7, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, He's referring to the law of Moses. He says, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, verse 8, how would the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now notice, he refers to the old covenant law of Moses as the ministry of death. He says, written and engraved on stones. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's the ceremonial law. No, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Those were written and engraved on stones. It says, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses, whose glory was passing away. See, that was all about the Old Covenant. There's a certain amount of glory, but it came in temporarily, and it was always fading out, passing away. All you see was the back parts of God as he as he walked away. But notice, how, how would the ministry of the Spirit, that's New Covenant, be more glorious? Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, that's Old Covenant, ministry of death, ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness, New Covenant, exceeds much more in glory. So the Old Covenant was the law of Moses. It was the ministry of death and condemnation. New Covenant of Grace in Christ, the Ministry of the Spirit, and the Ministry of Righteousness. And that's where we got to stop temporary and pick up in the next lesson. I tell you, we're just moving on through this. Boy, we're seeing some and uncovering some awesome truths, aren't we, about this New Covenant that we live in. Well, if you'd like additional materials and resources, you can always visit us on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we will see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.